summer may be winding down, but with fall comes football. What we've created for the fan or the person who comes here is a much better experience. And it's back to school. Wherever CTA goes, the UPass will take you. Maybe a weekend journey to a new Chicago neighborhood. It's a really tight-knit community. And who can forget the food? Whatever you're planning in September, the CTA can get you there. Glad you've joined us. I'm Dale Rivera. Welcome to Connections, where you'll find out everything you need to know about using public transportation in and around Chicago. Here's where we're headed this month on the CTA. It's back to school, so we'll head west for a visit to the UIC campus to get educated about Chicago's history and to learn something about saving money. Next, we're jumping on board the Blue Line, onto our destination, Pilsen, for some food, fun, and art. We'll pass the Paulina Connector, one of the CTA's newest service improvement projects, on our way to our final stop, O'Hare Airport. We begin our Connections adventure here at the new Soldier Field. For a year and a half, this place has been a construction zone, but this month, the Bears are back, driving for the end zone on their new home turf. Come on and take a look around. Soldier Field is our first stop. The last time there were touchdowns at Soldier Field, the Chicago Bears had a 13-3 season. It was all guts and glory in 2001. So will the Bears' return to their home turf bring as many triumphs? We'll soon find out as the Bears take on the Green Bay Packers for their home season opener on September 29th. The game will be the first one played at the new Soldier Field and broadcast on Monday Night Football. I don't know how many stadiums have ever opened up to literally a worldwide audience, but we're going to do that, and I think that's a sign of how excited I think everybody is about the new stadium. From the outside, much of Soldier Field still resembles the old stadium, with its grand colonnades and familiar facade. But one of the first things you notice is the new glass and steel grandstand, which adds a touch of the modern a feeling you get the moment you step inside. Let's start with the scoreboards. They're the largest in the NFL at 82 feet wide and 23 feet high. So from wherever you're sitting, you'll be able to see those replays in action. And not just the kind of replays you'll see on TV where you just see a frame, you'll be able to see 50 yards of action so that when there's a big play, you'll see the entire thing on that scoreboard. In the grandstand, fans are going to be sitting in bigger seats with their own cup holder, taking in the stadium's dynamic new sound and light systems. The new stadium also has double the number of concession stands and restrooms. The only catch is that there are going to be fewer fans inside the stadium. The new Soldier Field is a little smaller than the old one. It's 61,500 seats. That's 3,500 seats smaller. Uh, than old Soldier Field, but again, what we've created for the fan or the person who comes here is a much better experience. State-of-the-art technology has also been brought right down to the field. The Kentucky bluegrass the Bears will be playing on has its own irrigation and drainage system, so the field stays moist at all times. But most interesting underneath it is about 41 miles of tubing, about the thickness of a straw. And through that, we'll run a material called glycol, which actually heats up to 180 degrees, so that on the coldest of winter days, this field will never get colder than 50 degrees. Soldier Field first opened in 1924, and it was dedicated to the men and women who served in our armed forces. The new stadium will maintain that tradition with two new veterans' memorials. The old stadium also hosted a number of events over the years, including an appearance by aviator Charles Lindbergh, the first ski meet held in a stadium, and the largest ever football crowd of 123,000. It was one of the first multi-use stadiums ever. 
and it was a stadium where historic events have occurred. And we believe the new stadium will be even more like that, more multi-use, and again, uh, this is going to be Chicago history for the next 75 at least years. It's going to be exciting. The renovation of Soldier Field is a joint initiative between the City of Chicago and the Chicago Bears, and it's scheduled to be completed right on time so the Bears can take on the Packers. Well, it feels great. I mean, right now, like to use football terms, we're in the red zone. We're about five yards out. We, uh, you know, we don't want to fumble. We just want to punch it in. But here we are, you know, literally weeks from the opening of the new stadium on time and on budget. Of course, a great way to get to Soldier Field is on the CTA. Here's a look. Remember, the way to see the Bears play is with the help of the CTA. We're jumping on board the number 12 Roosevelt bus on our way to the University of Illinois at Chicago. This fall, college students who use the CTA can learn an important lesson about saving money using something called a U-Pass. All it takes is a little basic training. There's an inexpensive and easy way for college students to travel around Chicagoland this fall with the help of a CTA University Pass, or U-Pass. The CTA created the U-Pass in 1998 for students just like David Guidis, a sophomore at the University of Illinois at Chicago. David lives on campus, but he takes the CTA all over town to go to concerts, the airport, or to see his family. You never have to worry about if you have exact chain or anything like that. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. You can just get on any CTA bus or train that you want. The U-Pass means students ride the CTA at a discount, and they can transfer for free. The CTA developed the U-Pass to encourage ridership during off-peak hours and to get students familiar with public transportation. Our market research shows that once students go to school in the Chicago area, they tend to stay here and get jobs. The U-Pass provides an opportunity to learn how to use CTA and hopefully choose CTA as their primary source of transportation. U-Passes are provided to eligible full-time students at 30 colleges and universities in the Chicago area. It's a cheaper way to ride. You don't have to take your car anywhere. You avoid paying for parking fees and you can go anywhere you want in the city. Wherever CTA goes, the U-Pass will take you. At the start of each semester, students buy U-Passes through their university. Each pass is personalized with the student's picture on the front, as well as specific activation dates. So the student uses the U-Pass and the CA, the customer service attendant, can tell whether the student is actually that person or not, so it prevents fraud. The great news is the U-Pass comes with an added bonus. Not only do students save when riding CTA buses and trains, they also get a discount from participating merchants at more than 700 venues throughout the city. It's a wonderful opportunity to take advantage of both riding the CTA and getting discounts at various vendors. Thanks to U-Passes, more than 72,000 students ride the CTA at a discount. It's an economical way to get to explore such a wonderful city like Chicago, take advantage of the CTA, find out that we do offer on-time, safe, friendly, and clean service. Of course, saving money is important to students like David. Once or twice a week, it definitely will pay for itself tenfold by the end of the semester. Remember, students, when you arrive on campus this fall, be sure to start the year with a U-Pass and enjoy traveling around Chicago on the CTA. Whether you're a student or just someone who likes to learn, the CTA can take you to some of the most interesting neighborhood museums like the Jane Addams Hall House, located just steps from here on the UIC campus. The Jane Addams Hall House Museum pays tribute to an icon in Chicago's history. Jane Addams began her life in Cedarville, Illinois, the daughter of a wealthy Illinois state senator. After graduating from college, Addams decided that she wanted to help those in need. So she set up a settlement house in this Chicago community. When Hull House was founded in 1889, 
Uh, this was a port of entry, this neighborhood, the, what we now call the Near West Side, was a port of entry for immigrants coming from other parts of the country and from overseas. Hall House was originally the home of real estate developer Charles Hall. When Adams found the property, it was being used as a warehouse. They took it over, rented it, cleaned it up, decorated it like their own home because they wanted to create an inviting atmosphere for people in the neighborhood to come and visit. Conditions in this West Side neighborhood were tough in the late 1800s. Immigrants who came here lived in congested tenement houses, which contributed to health problems like tuberculosis. Adults and children alike worked long hours in poor conditions for low wages. There was garbage, there was mud in the streets, the houses were crowded and congested. It was not the best of living conditions. One of the earliest services offered by Hull House was childcare. The first thing they started was daycare because working women brought infants and toddlers over and said, can you take care of the babies? So it was clear there was a need in the community for daycare. And from there it proceeded to many, many other kinds of programs. The programs at Hull House went on to include English, theater, and art classes, as well as social and sports clubs. In addition, social services were developed to protect immigrants, women, and juveniles. A number of prominent Chicagoans helped to focus the spotlight on Hull House, such as Ida B. Wells and Frank Lloyd Wright, and the settlement was a success. The property expanded from one building to 13. By 1907, an estimated 8,000 people passed through Hull House each week. Jane Addams also became a success on the world stage. As a founder of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, she was the first American woman awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931. Despite her global fame, Adams was still in touch with the people from the West Side neighborhood. So even though she was thinking about all of these issues of world peace and the depression and all this kind of stuff, she really could also focus on the individual and, and communicate that she cared about the individual. A trip to Jane Addams' Hull House Museum gives visitors a sense of how, for decades, Chicagoans came together here to make a difference in others' lives. There's enough here so that you can come and relive this past, this part of history and see why it's so important. That's uh, an important part of Chicago history that, that people who grew up in the city and whose families grew up in the city uh, should know something about. This is, uh, this is a national historic landmark. The CTA's blue line is divided into three branches, one that goes to O'Hare, one that heads west to Forest Park, and another that takes customers to Chicago's west side and Cicero. That one is called the 54th Cermak Branch. And if you ride it, you'll see how recent improvements are helping to keep your travel plans on track. Renew the blue. That's the word from the CTA as it tackles its biggest project ever on the 54th Cermak branch of the Blue Line. The CTA is completely rebuilding this section of the Blue Line as well as eight of the line stations. And the best part is that while all this work is being done, the trains are still running, serving customers on Chicago's southwest side. Parts of the branch date all the way back to 1895. So after more than 100 years of service, the line needs a complete overhaul. We're replacing old with new. So you can, you can see the excitement that we have about this, this whole project. The rebuilding of the Blue Line involves replacing five miles of track, including 700 columns. The old wooden rail ties are also being removed and they're being replaced with technology from the 21st century, plastic ties. These ties are made by recycling the milk bottles you use at home. When the Cermak Blue Line is finished in early 2005, the biggest advantage for customers will be the speed of their commutes. Before the rehabilitation, 50% of the line was affected by slow zones, which reduced the speed of trains to as slow as 15 miles an hour. We're all very time conscious 
especially when you're going from one point to another point and you have a meeting to go to or whatever, you know, time is of the essence. So to put the rapid back in rapid transit is awesome. Once the slow zones are gone, a trip from the terminal at 54th Cermak to the loop will take 28 minutes instead of taking 35. I think it's a great idea to, to do that, make it fast. Along with rebuilding the tracks, eight stations serving the 54th Cermak branch of the Blue Line are also being renovated. Rebuilding each station is a huge project. The CTA sets up a temporary station while the old station is reconstructed. Customers are able to catch their trains at the nearby temporary station, built to keep business running as usual. The CTA is right on schedule with the new stations. In fact, two are already finished and open to customers. Let's check one of them out. When trains began arriving at Costner this summer, customers were all smiling about their newly rebuilt neighborhood station. We love it. It's something that's very positive in the community and something that we have looked for for a long time. Formerly Kildare Station, it was renamed Costner as part of the renovation because the main entrance to the station was moved to Costner. In this case, Costner gives us two options for customers. They can use the Kildare Station side, which was always open to customers, and we now have a new main entrance at Costner. The CTA's focus is always on customer needs. And with the renovation of Costner, the CTA was able to pay special attention to amenities for customers with disabilities. With the help of a wheelchair accessible turnstile and ramp, Costner is now fully accessible. There are braille signs for the visually impaired, and a TTY telephone was installed for the hearing impaired. On the station platform, there are also gap fillers available to help customers in wheelchairs get on and off the trains. It's our attempt to service all of our customers, and so we need to make the system available to them just as well as others. It creates an attractiveness to the station. It allows everyone to use and take advantage of our system. There are other features at Costner Station that will help customers every day they ride the CTA, like new benches, enhanced lighting, a speaker system, digital signs, as well as canopies and windbreaks to protect customers from bad weather. I'm standing in one of our windbreaks. The windbreaks are for customers to take shelter in when it's raining, when it's windy, when it's cold. We have heaters here that are available in the winter. Push a button and customers are ready to go. As with the entire Blue Line project, the CTA involved members of the community in the renovation. It makes the Blue Line Transit Task Force feel good that uh, everything's going right along as it was planned. I am very excited that stations are being rehabilitated in our community. I'm very excited that we have been able to develop a relationship with CTA. The reopening of Costner Station is a significant event in the Blue Line Rehabilitation Project and a sign of things to come from the CTA. We're really excited about the opportunity to showcase this to our customers, to show them that we're committed to providing service throughout our entire system and upgrading our system so that it is in fact in a state of good repair wherever our customers traverse it. The 54th Cermak branch will take you through one of Chicago's most vibrant communities. If you love art, a good enchilada, and a real neighborhood, jump off at 18th Street and spend the day enjoying Chicago's largest Mexican community. Our destination, Pilsen. If you've never been to Pilsen, be prepared for an experience. This is one of Chicago's most vibrant communities. Just ask anyone who lives here. It's a lot of fun, kind of like Mardi Gras all the time. Here you'll feel a little like you're in Mexico. After all, it's the largest Mexican community in Chicago. Our guide is Silvia Rivera, a greeter from the Chicago Office of Tourism's Chicago Greeter Program. So Silvia, what makes Pilsen such a great destination? Oh, there are so many different things. Uh, number one, the people. It's a really tight-knit community. Uh, everybody's really friendly here. 
It's just a really a strong sense of family. Uh, secondly, I mean, there's great murals. And who can forget the food? Say no more. On virtually every corner, you'll find restaurants specializing in authentic Mexican cuisine. And just like you can't help but savor the food here, you can't help but notice the art. Pilsen is known as a great place to live, especially if you're an artist. So Heather, tell me a little bit about the arts community here in Pilsen. Well, the arts community here in Pilsen has been around for over 40 years. And every year we host a open house event, open studios event, called the annual Artist Open House. At this year's open house, set for the first weekend in October, artists like Ned Broderick open their doors to the public. Many artists live or work in spaces developed by the Pomajerski family, who have been major supporters of artists in Pilsen for three generations. Central to the open house is this courtyard, where many artists find inspiration. It's a great place. It's kind of a, considered the hub of the Artist Open House. It's a great place to kind of get acquainted to the area, meet uh, some of the artists and view their work right in their studios. And it's just a very lively uh, atmosphere. In Pilsen, artwork is everywhere. Colorful murals and mosaics adorn building exteriors and even interiors, like inside the CTA's 18th Street L Station. So Sylvia, the artwork in Pilsen has found its way up here to the 18th Street Station. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, it has. Um, in 1997, the Adopt a Station program was initiated basically to turn train stations into centers of community to make them more welcoming and more appealing uh, to people that you know, take the train every day. It's hard not to feel welcomed by the vibrant murals along the walls, even in the stairwells here. The works depict many important cultural icons in Mexican history. Of course, lovers of art can't visit Pilsen without a stop at the Mexican Fine Arts Center Museum. When the museum first opened, uh, it opened in Pilsen, and that was a very, very strategic idea. Uh, the idea was to have an internationally renowned museum within the Mexican community. Here, you'll find folk art, photographs, sculptures, and prints, works from both Mexico and from Mexican communities across the United States. Among the highlights of the museum are our annual Day of the Dead exhibition. We have that every year in the fall. Some of the other highlights that we have are the permanent exhibition, Mexicanidad, Our Past is Present, in which we divide the Mexican history or the cultural history up into five separate sections. Be sure to pass through the gift shop for a book or a keepsake imported from Mexico. One of the busiest corners in Pilsen is at 18th Street, Ashland, and Blue Island Avenues. Here you'll find the Rudy Lozano Public Library home of one of the city's largest collections of Spanish language books. And in honor of the community's Mexican connection, a reproduction of Mexico City's symbolic eagle perched on a stone pedestal. It's at this corner that you'll also find Pilsen's version of NBC's Today Show. So Sylvia, we're at a pretty famous intersection here in Pilsen, and here's a place that's got its own claim to fame. Tell me a little bit about it. Right, well, we're at Radio Arte right now, and Radio Arte is the only, the nation's only, entirely youth-operated radio station in the country. It's also bilingual. Kids between the ages of 15 and 21 run the show here. Located at 90.5 on the FM dial, Radio Arte offers an eclectic blend of music and talk. So how does the program work for the kids that are involved? Well, it's a two-year program. They receive uh, basic training in journalism, and production skills, interviewing skills. Uh, thereafter, they're actually allowed to, you know, do their DJ thing and have their own programs, do regular programming, and uh, produce some really great shows. So come to Pilsen, and in addition to seeing some great art, enjoy a cup of java at one of many charming coffee shops here, or shop at one of the community's many fine stores. Here's how to get to Pilsen on the CTA.
I would encourage people to make a day of a trip down to Pilsen. Uh, it's almost like almost like going to Mexico, uh, except you can take the CTA there, obviously. It's a really, really well-rounded experience. We're jumping back on the blue line, on our way to our final stop, O'Hare. To get there, we'll go back downtown before heading northwest to the airport. On our way, we'll see the Paulina Connector, which is being renovated to give the CTA more service options and to help keep CTA customers on the move. On the west side of Chicago, between the green and blue line, sits the Paulina Connector. This little stretch of train track hasn't carried passengers in more than 45 years, but soon, that's all going to change. As part of the Blue Line Rehabilitation Project, the Paulina Connector is going to be back in service, providing an easy link between the green and blue lines, creating more service options. What that's going to do is get us a great deal more flexibility in our operations. For instance, we'll have the capacity to take what are currently the CIRMAC branch of the Blue Line trains and route them to the loop via Lake Street. Coming out of the loop, westbound Blue Line trains are split between two different routes, the Forest Park branch or the 54th CIRMAC branch. Soon, the CTA will have the option of routing trains via the Paulina connector as well. More options means more flexibility and better service. It enables us to run trains as frequently as is called for by the uh, demand out there. The Paulina Connector dates back to 1895 when it was built as part of the Metropolitan West Side Elevated Railroad. The line was closed in the 1950s, and since then the Paulina Connector has only been used to transfer rail equipment. This is the only rail link between the Blue Line and the rest of the L, and so we need to use this to move equipment to our heavy maintenance facilities in Skokie. Rebuilding the Paulina Connector means the CTA isn't starting from scratch, but reusing an existing track. And so because that infrastructure is in place already, we can use that to our advantage and actually achieve a very significant savings. The Paulina Connector is expected to be finished in 2005. But this may only be the beginning. The line will also serve as the first phase of a proposed project, the Circle Line, which would link all of CTA's rail lines. It's the most ambitious project we have right now at CTA in terms of rail extension. The Paulina Connector is just one more way the CTA is modernizing its service. Thousands of customers use the CTA to get to and from O'Hare Airport. And why not? When you consider the trip helps you avoid congestion on the Kennedy Expressway and at $1.50 costs far less than a taxi. So pack your bags. O'Hare is our last stop. Every day, 190,000 travelers pass through O'Hare International Airport, the nation's busiest. It's easy to get to on the CTA. Just take the blue line. Trains run 24 hours a day and are accessible to every airport terminal. Remember, with the holiday travel season fast approaching, avoid the hassles of driving and get to and from O'Hare on the CTA. We'll meet you right back here at O'Hare Airport next month for the start of another Connections adventure around Chicagoland. Thanks for watching. I'm Dale Rivera. See you next time on Connections. For more information about the CTA or to use the RTA's trip planner, visit our website at www.transitchicago.com or for customer service matters, call 1-888-YOUR-CTA. For travel information, call the RTA at 836-7000 from anywhere in the Chicago area. And to find out more about the Chicago Office of Tourism's Chicago Greeter Program, call 312-744-8000 or visit chicagogreeter.com on the web.